right. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, I am Dr. Sarah Boyce. I am the Director of Research and Education for the Linda Lori Nature Foundation. And welcome to Science Pub. Um, I'm so excited. This is our seventh year doing Science Pub, which is pretty awesome. We've had some amazing speakers, but this is our first year. As I was just telling Lucy, this is our first full year doing Science Pub fully on Zoom. So for those of you who never attended an original Science Pub, it's called Science Pub because it used to be held in a pub or a bar. Um, and we are thankful to our many um, restaurants that have hosted us over the years, most recently the Salt Box Tavern and Table. So support your local restaurants. But we've been really fortunate by moving um, our Science Pub virtually to Zoom because we've had um, lots of new audience members, but also we've been able to have great speakers like our speaker tonight. But before I get into formal introductions, I just want to say a few um, notes about the Linda Lurie Nature Foundation. So at the Linda Lurie Nature Foundation, we connect people with science and nature and Science Pub is just one of the ways. Um, I have a few notes, uh, program notes. This week is our last week of our spring bio blitz. So rather than a bio blitz, it's more like a bio stroll. We have a spring springtime bio blitz. So if you're interested in participating this week for Nantucket, it is island-wide Nantucket bio blitz. Um, check out llnf.org and learn about how you can join in and um, take some biodiversity information while learning about uh, nature on Nantucket. Um, I also wanted to tell everyone that our last virtual nature trivia for the winter is going to, well, it's not really winter, but for the season, is going to be Wednesday, April 28th. Um, it's from 6 to 8 p.m. We've had a ton of fun doing um, nature trivia. There's lots of Nantucket nature questions, but there's random nature um, uh, questions as well. It's been really fun. You can if you want to sign up a team or as an individual, that again, go to llnf.org. It's free to join and it's been really fun. Um, and what else did I want to say? Oh, um, and we have one more science pub um, next month. We um, don't have a confirmed date, but we're going to be talking about water quality on Nantucket um, and harmful algal blooms in particular and the program that's a uh, cooperation between the town um, the Nantucket Lane Council and other organizations um, that have pond edge property. So that will be pretty interesting. And so keep, we'll keep an eye on our events calendar for when that will be. All right, and now without much further ado, sorry, I'm in a silly mood today. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really excited for um, tonight's speaker. We have Dr. Lucy Ziff. Um, Lucy is a community ecologist studying the integrated impacts of co-occurring global change, climate, habitat and conservation management, all on biological communities in New England. So Lucy recently received her PhD from Boston University and is currently a visiting lecturer at Wellesley College. And we're really fortunate to have Lucy here today and hear about some conservation research. So um, with that, I will hand it over to Lucy and I am going to hide myself. <laughs> Beautiful, I will share my screen. Uh, and I'll also say you may see a tufted titmouse pop into this window. I just I just glimpsed one, but I put some there's a bird feeder out there. So if you catch catch a glimpse of a bird, it's probably a titmouse, um, which is just a tidbit. There are no titmice on Nantucket. Oh, well, we could have a fun visitor then if we... they're afraid to fly over water. So every wow. once in a while they get blown over here, but we do not have tufted titmouses, titmice. Okay. That, that is a very fun fact. I, I consider them like my co-workers because I don't see a lot of people this year at Wellesley, so I get to hang out with my, my tufted titmice. So maybe I'm in a silly mood today too. <laughs> um, can we see my screen okay? Cool, awesome. So we can jump in to this talk. A few, I will just say a few kind of logistical things. So if you have your Zoom set up so that you can move my face around in a little, um, a little window. I encourage you to put it into this top corner so that it doesn't interfere with any text or images on my slides. Uh, and then I want to start off with a land acknowledgement, acknowledging that the, um, let me get all my things set up. Uh, I want to start with a land acknowledgement just to say that all of the work I'm presenting on today took place on the stolen and occupied territory of the Wampanoag, Massachusetts, Pawtucket, and Nitmic indigenous people. 
And I also want to start off with a human, another human acknowledgement of all the people that contributed to this work. So I'm going to say we a lot as I go through this talk, uh, because I did not do any of this work alone. I worked like uh, was just beautifully introduced on this project through my PhD at Boston University, where I worked with a ton of amazing undergraduate researchers. So I'll highlight them as we go through. Um, I've also worked in collaboration with Mass Audubon through these projects. So I worked with a lot of scientists and community scientists um, at Mass Audubon. And then I'm now at Wellesley College where I'm working with some students on kind of answering some of these lingering hypotheses that are lingering questions that resulted from this work. So a ton of you know, community-wide effort that went into this community project. Uh, and I will start my talk by breaking down this title, which is a little bit different than the one that's on the program. I apologize, um, but I thought this one just a little bit better represented exactly what I'm talking about today. And that is the effects of climate, habitat, and conservation management on an aerial insectivore, the tree swallow, and its insect prey. So here I have kind of stylized a tree swallow and its insect prey. Um, and so these are the kind of main, main players in this story. So we're thinking about this insectivorous bird, this aerial insectivorous bird that eats insects while in flight and those small flying insects that make up its prey. And we are interested in both of these groups of organisms for many reasons that I will jump into, but I do wanna highlight one more key life history characteristic about tree swallows that's important to this work aside from their being aerial insectivores is that they are secondary cavity nesting birds. Um, and so I'm sure it sounds like a lot of us have maybe even been involved in nest box monitoring, but we are interested in these birds because they nest in pre-established cavities. So I have a picture here of a pair of tree swallows in a uh, cavity in a tree, in a standing dead tree. Um, so this would be a natural cavity available to these birds, but we know they also readily nest in managed landscapes in artificial nest boxes. And so their, you know, status as an aerial insectivore and their characteristic of being secondary cavity nesters are both important to um, the work that I'm going to continue talking about. We're interested in tree swallows and insects as well, because we know that both of these groups are the tree swallows and then insects as a group of organisms are declining in abundance throughout North America and throughout much of the world. And so we may be familiar with this very uh, large study that came out in 2019, Rosenberg et al documenting this huge decline in bird populations in North America. And so this is a New York Times uh, headline uh, the birds are va birds are vanishing from North America uh, reporting on this you know three billion um, loss of three billion birds throughout the continent which represents about a 30 percent loss in in birds and we know that this decline was widespread across many groups one group that is experiencing very rapid declines are aerial insectivores so tree swallows are a representative organism from this larger group that's having these large scale population declines. Um, and while we have great records of the fact that this species and aerial insectivores as a group are declining, there's still a lot of questions about the mechanisms or the drivers behind that decline. And so through my work, I'm gonna spend some time thinking about declines in reproductive success, um, potentially contributing to larger population declines in this species. And then at the same time, as we have these records of large scale bird declines, we've also seen some studies come out about insect declines. And some of us may have heard uh, kind of this foretelling of the insect apocalypse, where there were a few papers that came out at a similar time in like 2019, 2020, yeah, maybe 2018, 2019, uh, documenting huge scale declines in insect populations, potentially even, you know, apocalyptic declines in insect populations. Um, and so we know that if the uh, birds that eat flying insects are declining and their prey atoms are declining, there may be some interplay there in um, kind of in the insects themselves being a, a contributing factor to bird decline broadly. So we wanted to investigate both these groups of species um, to help get at the mechanisms or at least better understand the potential drivers of change in their populations. And we uh, identified these three potential uh, human driven changes that may be impacting tree swallow and insect populations, climate change, habitat change, or kind of habitat management and conservation management. And so I've uh, picked these three as kind of representative components of global change. So global change being a broad term for any human driven 
alteration of the environment. So anyway, people are manipulating the landscape falls under the, the larger umbrella of global change. Uh, and I'm focused my work, um, I have a picture of New England here, uh, but I focus my work specifically in Massachusetts because in New England and then in Massachusetts, um, we have this really amazing long-term record of environmental change and a long-term record of bio biological trends over time in this region as well. So it's a great place to study human impacts over large timescales because not only has there been a lot of change, but there's been a lot of documentation of that change. And so I didn't have to do, you know, a 50 year PhD project, I could take advantage of some of these long term records of change in the region. So I'm going to take a few minutes to go through how climate habitat and conservation have changed in Massachusetts and in New England more broadly over the past 150, 200 or so years. Um, and then we'll jump into the specifics of the tree swallow project that I'm talking about today. So I'm, um, I'm probably not going to have to convince many of us about climate change here tonight, uh, but the climate, of course, is changing on a global scale. We're seeing uh, increases in temperature at a global scale, driving changes in hydrology um, and in ecosystem functioning broadly. We know that in New England specifically, air temperature has warmed by about 1.7 degrees Celsius since 1901. Uh, and we've, I like this uh, graph here, which is or this uh, map here, which is showing us the rate of temperature change across the contiguous United States over this 100 year time period. And if we look at the scale bar, it's showing us that areas that are darker red are warming at a faster rate. So the increase in temperature over the past 100 years has been higher. And then if we get into these cooler blue colors, um, that represents a, a lower rate of change. And so if we look across the US, we can see there's even though net the globe is warming there's actually a lot of variability in the rate of change with climate change and if we zoom in on new england and massachusetts we can see that this part of the u.s is warming more rapidly than much of the rest of the country so we're seeing this really rapid increase in temperature in new england so it represents kind of a great place to do climate change research because the the net change in temperature over time has been so high here we know at the same time, uh, precipitation patterns are changing through much of the world, and that's the case in New England as well. So over the last 50 years, we've seen about a 10% increase in precipitation in Massachusetts. And we know a lot more of that rain is falling, or rain is falling, a lot more of that precipitation is falling as rain rather than snow. And a lot more of the rainfall is in these really intense storm events um, with really heavy rainfall. So we're seeing this increase in intensity of storms as well. And if we look at this figure here, it is showing us the change in daily precipitation. So this is kind of an average precipitation metric uh, over the last 50-ish years. And we see that much of the nation, uh, or the contiguous United States at least, is increasing uh, in precipitation on this daily uh, precipitation metric. But we see that New England, again, is increasing at a higher magnitude. So the change in daily precipitation is higher here, uh, the increase is higher than much of the rest of the country. So again, it represents this really interesting place to do work on the impacts of climate change because these two main consequences of climate change, warming and precipitation change are kind of magnified in this region. We know at the same time, the climate has been changing. There's been large changes in regional habitat. And so I'm gonna walk through a few hundred years of land use change in the region pretty quickly, but um, just to give us kind of a, an understanding of how, what I'm talking about when I'm talking about regional landscape change. And so we know that pre-European settlement, although the landscape was being actively used by many indigenous groups, um, their dominant forest cover in the region was this old growth forest. Uh, and this picture is not a picture from 1600, but a picture from the Harvard Forest Museum diorama exhibit where there's different, um, these huge beautiful dioramas of different uh, land cover during different periods in Massachusetts in New England. Uh, and so if anyone's ever been there, you know it's, it's a lovely place to go. And if you haven't, I highly recommend it. Um, but this is a representative image of what a forest would have looked like in Massachusetts in 1600. So we see that there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of diversity in the structure of these forests. There's a lot of different kind of levels of canopy. Um, there's a lot of biological diversity and a lot of the trees in this forest are very old. And we know in these old, these old growth forests tend to have higher abundances of 
uh, standing dead trees, which are another standing dead tree pictured here with two little tree swallows on it. Uh, these standing dead trees tend to have a lot of those natural cavities or natural nesting places for cavity nesting birds. And so we know that this habitat would have likely represented um, a fairly uh, good habitat or a fairly um, high quality nesting habitat for many cavity nesters. And then after European settlement and land clearing, so when Europeans got here, they cleared the forests, uh, kind of clear cut the forest in many cases and uh, for agriculture. And so a lot of these previously forested landscapes now were open field habitats. Um, and as those old growth forests were removed, that really biologically diverse landscape was eliminated and in its place were these open croplands or open fields. Um, and then after a few decades or so of farming, uh, people in the region realized that it actually wasn't that great of a place for agriculture. And the minimum land cover or the minimum forest cover in the region was reached in about 1850, after which forests began to regrow as farmland was abandoned um, as people moved west to farm. And then uh, as forests regrew for the next 100 or so, 150 years, uh, we've seen that now the landscape in New England is heavily forested, but a lot of those forests or those forests don't really look like the old growth forests that preceded them because they're much younger. Um, they're not as biologically or structurally diverse and they tend to be more homogenous, um, meaning there are there's lower diversity. There's a lot of stands of very similar um, tree species. Uh, there's just not as much biodiversity in these forests as there are in older growth forests. And this is a consequence of invasive species, um, of human manipulation of the landscape and planting trees, uh, as well as urbanization and urban expansion kind of dictating where and what species can live in given habitats. And so we've had this huge scale change in habitat, this regional landscape scale change in habitat um, over time that animals and plants have had to deal with at the same time as we have had uh, huge scale changes in climate, which our climate changes really started ramping up kind of in the 1950s to today. So over this time period, um, really in the late 18, early 1900s, people in the region started to see that human activity was having a negative impact on wildlife uh, and started to make efforts to, to conserve the landscape and to conserve species. And when people looked to the landscape, saw forests regrowing, um, so they weren't seeing as many of those birds, for example, that were living in open field habitats, and there was a lack of naturally available cavities for cavity nesting birds, um, we started to see conservation areas try to actively promote biodiversity on their landscapes by um, mowing fields or just managing landscapes for a diversity of species or a diversity of ecosystem types. And one pretty easy way to account for some of that lost naturally available nesting site for cavity nesting birds is to erect artificial breeding structures like nest boxes. Uh, and so here I have one of the best pictures I've taken in a while of a tree swallow poking its head out of a nest box. Um, we know that these tree swallows readily use nest boxes. You ha all have them at um, your nature site as well. Uh, and so we have this kind of positive human change, but still a human change to the landscape of altering the available breeding habitat in a conservation area. So what I'm interested in is how these co-occurring changes, so large scale human driven changes like climate change, regional scale changes like habitat shifts, and local scale changes like on the ground conservation management decisions impact bird populations. Uh, and I'm also interested in how they impact the insect populations that are supporting those breeding birds. And so this is really the motivation for a lot of my work. Um, we kind of work, combine these like uh, was mentioned these co-occurring land or co-occurring human driven changes to ask what are the driving forces behind some of the declines in bird populations or changes in insect abundances in um, in Massachusetts and in New England. So a way that I have been able to ask these questions about long term change is by using long term data sets. And so I've, um, like I mentioned, I've really been very lucky to be able to work with conservation organizations who have long term records of ecological um, and biological phenomena uh, to be able to look at changes in climate, land use, and conservation, as well as the kind of reactive changes in biology of birds and insects at the same time. 
And the two sets of data, or the kind of two metrics of uh, data that I've, I've used through these studies are records of bird and insect phenology, uh, which is the timing of biological seasonal events. So any biological event you can associate with a particular time of year is a phenological event. Right now, early spring is like my favorite time of year because of the young leaves popping out on branches. Uh, leaf out is a phenological event. Um, I'm starting to wear sandals instead of so closed toed shoes. That's like my personal change with the season. Um, we can also think about phenological events in terms of birds and insects. And so when a bird lays its first egg in a nest for a year, that's a reproductive pheno phenological event. When, um, the, when uh, chicks fledge at the end of or fledge during the breeding season, that first fledging is a phenological event. Uh, similar with uh, insects, insect emergence is a phenological event in the year. Um, and these are all kind of spring events. And that's what I'm gonna focus on in my talk today. But there are of course, end of season and fall events like bird migration at the end of the breeding season, um, all fall under this category of phenology. And phenology represents a really accessible way to study uh, birds and insects because it's so visible. It's really easy to see, you know, the first or first few birds that arrive to a landscape. It's easy to see the first egg in a nest. So it makes this um, a great opportunity for community engagement and engagement with community science groups in monitoring these phenological events. And so I've been, I've had a lot of fun working with a lot of community scientists through these projects as well. Uh, we've also have records of reproductive success of birds over time. Uh, in particular, I'm going to be talking about hatching success and fledging success, as well as clutch sizes. And so we have these two major categories of bird and insect um, fitness and just timing that we can look at over time along, you know, records of environmental change. So that's the overarching goal of this work is to update and use long-term records of environmental change uh, and these ecological observations to document relationships between birds and insects and climate land use and conservation management. And that's what I've done uh, a lot of my work on and I'm continuing to work on. So a lot of this work is kind of early, is still in, um, in process of being completed, but I'll highlight that as we go through. And so I'll just highlight some of the major research questions that I'll be talking about uh, the rest of this talk. So first, we wanted to use our records of uh, tree soil reproductive success over time to ask, has tree soil reproductive success declined over time? So do we find evidence for a uh, reduction in reproductive success that may be uh, potentially contributing to the larger decline in tree soil populations uh, throughout the continent? We then wanted to, we then asked our trends in annual reproductive performance, so success and phenology related to insect availability or prey availability, climate or local habitat. So do we see any of these um, environmental factors in the breeding grounds related to reproductive performance? Uh, then we asked if there was relationships between the way we manage individual nest boxes and tree soil reproductive performance in those boxes. So on the really small scale of human, um, of human interference in the landscape, erecting these nest boxes, does that have any impact on the way we manage those boxes, have any impact on tree swallows? And then lastly, we wanted to make sure that this work had a really applied um, approach. So we wanted to make sure through these projects, we were able to provide nest management recommendations for Mass Audubon, who the conservation organization I was working with, um, to make sure that these results could inform future management of landscapes to promote tree swallow reproduction. So first, we will think about these questions one and two. Uh, and of course, we're talking about tree swallows. And so our study species for this project were tree swallows, again, because we're interested in understanding their population trends over time because of this larger decline and because they are these secondary cavity nesting birds. So they're really easy to study <laughs> because you can just walk up to these boxes and unlatch that door and take a look um, to monitor reproduction over the breeding season. The first part of this project was all done at Broadmoor Wildlife Sanctuary, which is the Mass Audubon property in South Natick, Massachusetts. And so I'm probably like five minutes away from uh, Broadmoor right now, and I'm on the Wellesley campus, uh, which is very convenient for me. Uh, across the sanctuary, there's a diversity of ecosystem types or of landscapes. So we have 
these um, open field habitats, forested habitat, wetland habitat, so represented a real gradient of habitat type, which was great. And across this, this uh, sanctuary, there are 53 nest boxes that we uh, monitored over time. The nest boxes were monitored um, by volunteers, so by community scientists who were part of Mass Audubon between 1987 and 2019. And so though this is a 32 year time period, we only had 14 years of data that we could use for these analyses uh, just because of missing years um, within that, that period. And so we wound up breaking them up into these older chunk of data, 1987 to 1994, and these, 20, these newer set of data or these 2012 to 2019 years. And so you'll see this orange and blue um, distinction again, and I'll point that out again, but we have these 14 years of data that we kind of roughly broke up between these two time periods. And over these, uh, over nest box monitoring through the entire duration of data collection, uh, community scientist members were monitoring the date of clutch initiation. So the date the first egg was laid in a nest, which is a measure of reproductive phenology and clutch size. So how many eggs were laid, which is a measure of reproductive success. And so here I have my friend, Chris, who I volunteered with for many years, um, checking a tree swallow nest box to see a fairly uh, robust clutch of eggs. Then when I joined the project in 2015, we added some more fine scale information on hatching and fledging success. So we're able to learn more about kind of end of season reproductive performance as well. Next, we wanted to quantify the environmental conditions that birds were facing in the breeding ground every year. And so to do that, we want to assess prey availability, climate and local habitat. Uh, first, we'll ta we're tackling prey availability uh, and the well, I, I mentioned that people, um, it's really accessible to monitor birds, right, because they're big and they're easy to spot, but there's a lot fewer records of uh, aerial insects, specifically of small flies that these tree swells like to eat. Um, so we didn't have as long term a record of, um, of insect abundance, but we did have a uh, survey of insects from 1991 that was done at Broadmoor. So our first step of this insect piece was to update that um, insect abundance record. So we took the same protocols that were used in 1991 and monitored in 2019. We also expanded it a bit, uh, as I have written here. We're currently working on this insect piece to expand the amount of data we have. Um, we were working on it last year too, but things got a little thrown off for 2020, but we're back at it in 2021. Uh, and so the, the goal of this first step of this prey availability analysis was to determine between these two snapshots in time, if there was any interesting trends or interesting information that fell out, even though we're just comparing two years, we just wanted to see um, how, did, how different does the picture look between 1991 and 2019. And so to do that, we collected daily insect abundance uh, at two sites within our site, within Broadmoor. Uh, we had these standing, um, insect nets that were on uh, rotating nets with these fixed open mouths. So they were always downwind for insects to fly or be blown into. And uh, so they would enter this open mouth and then be collected in these collection jars at the base. And so we have daily records of insects at these two sites. And again, we're updating this again this year as well as comparing um, this fixed uh, wind sock method with uh, some other insect collection methods. So that should be a fun project. And I'll just show you some of the results from this snapshot um, uh, comparison between 1991 and 2019. We found that there was no difference in insect abundance between these two time periods or between these two years. So the amount of insects, amount of aerial insects was very similar in 1991 to 2019. Um, we did see that there was a huge decline in biodiversity of the samples collected in 2019 compared to 1991. Uh, and so this figure is showing comparisons between dipterans, which are true flies, which are the majority of, of insects that tree swallows eat, um, but dipterans compared to all other insects. So you can see in both years, the majority of insects we captured were flies, but in uh, 2019, which is this darker green bars, we had almost all the insects we captured were flies, relative, very few, relatively very few uh, other species were represented or even other orders were represented in our samples. Uh, and so this was interesting because we know that tree swallows are, the, 
prey quality is kind of just as important, if not maybe more important than prey, prey quantity for these birds when they're breeding. There's been some really cool work that's come out of the Cornell Lab of Ornithology recently, uh, showing that tree swallows have, and uh, tree swallow adults and young have very specific omega-3 fatty acid requirements uh, during the breeding season that are not generally found in these small flies that were in the majority of our samples. So future directions for this project are going to be looking at the quality of prey items through the breeding season for tree swallows and seeing if we do find any evidence that there has been a decline in prey quality over time. Um, and I have done some other projects on insects in Massachusetts looking at butterflies, which are not prey items of tree swallows generally, but we just have a lot more uh, records of butterflies because butterflies are fun to look at. Um, so we have a lot more kind of community collected records of butterflies. And so we've seen some evidence there that the phenology of butterfly emergence has changed dramatically over time. And so it may be the case that insects available to tree swallows while they're breeding now are different because the phenology of the insects has advanced much more rapidly than the phenology of the birds. And so this is definitely where a lot of this current work is being done in this project. Um, and we're very excited to explore some of these hypotheses. Jumping back into our environmental variables, uh, we also wanted to see how climate during the breeding season was related to tree swallow reproductive performance. And so we had climate information uh, for the month, every month of the breeding season, and then for five day weather windows right before the phenological events. So five days before egg laying or five days before hatching to see if shorter term weather uh, was important in reproductive performance in these birds. And then lastly, we quantified local habitat uh, in 1991 and in 2019. Uh, they were relatively similar because this is a managed landscape that um, had uh, that has been managed similarly between those two time periods. It's, there's the same sanctuary director has been there, um, but we still have these records of land cover right around the nests. So we used this US Geological Survey land cover map. Um, so we have Broadmoor's land cover map here with the different land cover types. Uh, and we collected information on the extent of each land cover or uh, within a hundred meter and 200 meter radius of nests, what was the uh, extent of each habitat type within those radii and to give information on what the habitat was like around those nests now and in the past. Uh, we also have information on the distance between each nest and its two nearest neighbors to uh, account for kind of nest density or clustering as well. Then we conducted our analyses for this project where we compared reproductive performance between our older set of data and our newer set of data to see if there's any change in reproductive success between those two time points. And then we used a uh, generalized linear model approach to determine the breeding season conditions that best predicted reproductive performance. So we put all of those habitat and climate metrics into this model and asked what aspects of the local environment best predicted the reproductive performance in a given year. Um, and so it tells us the kind of likely relationships between environment and reproductive performance in these birds. We didn't include uh, prey availability in these models because we only had information for those two time points, but we are going to expand that as we collect more insect information over time. And we will jump into some results. So here I'm going to show you the uh, clutch size per nest of the uh, tree swallow nest in that our older set of information, our 1987 to 1994 data, and then our newer set of information to see if there's any difference in clutch size between these two time points. And we found that clutches were about 0.5 eggs per nest lower now than they were in the past. And so every other nest had one less egg, <laughs> Not, there wasn't half sized eggs in the nest. Um, but this was really interesting to us because as many of us who've monitored tree swallow nests know, they're not laying very many eggs. Uh, and so this change represented about an 18% reduction in egg laying in 2012 to 2019 compared to 1987 to 1994. And we know if this trend, uh, we are looking to see if this trend is present across other habitats. And if this trend is true, it could definitely be a contributing factor to declines in tree swallow abundance in this region. However, we didn't find any evidence that changes in climate or changes in habitat 
were driving this difference in clutch size. So there's likely something else happening in the landscape that we weren't able to capture that's driving that decline. Uh, it could be this insect piece. So this decline in prey quality um, over time or change in prey phenology may be related to this declining clutch size. So this is definitely a hypothesis that is open for testing. Uh, next, I'm going to show you a figure of how reproductive phenology has changed with, change, with uh, temperature. And so now we're going to look at these. This y-axis is the average annual clutch initiation day of year. Uh, and so this is the first day um, an egg is laid in the nest. And a lower number on this axis represents something happening earlier in the year. So we think about day of year with January 1 being day 1, something earlier in the year. It's a lower number. And then we're going to be comparing that clutch initiation uh, across April temperatures. So we have temperatures increasing across the x-axis here. And what we saw was over our 32-year time period, reproductive phenology uh, has advanced in warmer years. And so we saw that when birds were going to lay their eggs were best predicted by spring temperature, meaning that eggs are laid earlier in warmer years, and precipitation, where we saw eggs were laid later in wetter years, likely because tree swallows don't like to fly and forage and build nests in the rain. And so we saw that in predicting the timing of reproduction, um, climate was really important. And this is likely because the warmer uh, a given year is, especially here in New England, the earlier spring starts. So plants are leafing out and flowering, insects are emerging, and it seems that tree swallows are able to track that change um, in phenology of the region, uh, even though they're migrating great distances. So they're not necessarily here when spring begins. And so this was definitely an interesting finding. Um, and one we were, um, we hypothesized to see, but we're, we're excited to see play out in the data. Next, we thought about how um, the habitat around nest impacted the reproductive performance of these birds or was related to reproductive performance. And so here, we're going to look at mean fledging success. Uh, and so we're looking at this on a proportion scale where a zero uh, represents a nest failure where none of the chicks that hatched fledged and a one represents a complete success uh, where all the chicks that hatched fledged. Looking at how mean fledging success varies with the amount of open water in the habitat, in the um, habitat right around a nest box. So in the 100 meter foraging rate or 100 meter radius of these nest boxes. Uh, and we were interested in this relationship to see if where you place the boxes may um, be a mediator in predicting reproductive performance. We found that this relationship where nest boxes that had more open water habitat right adjacent to the boxes tended to have higher fledging success. And so we saw that fledging success was about 25% higher in nests that had over 20% open water habitat in that 100 meter radius, uh, which is a significant relationship um, and one we were really interested in, in finding. Uh, we, again, don't have the exact mechanism for this relationship, just highlighted that it exists, but um, we're doing work uh, and future work at Wellesley and beyond. We'll think about the relationship between early season emergent aquatic insects, um, providing really high quality prey in these water adjacent habitats for breeding tree swallows early in the breeding season when there's relatively few insects available for them. Uh, and this finding, this finding that fledging success had relationships with uh, local scale habitat led me down this new research path thinking critically about conservation management and how it impacts um, reproductive performance. And so we will kind of jump in to our other two research questions here, now thinking a little bit more about how nest box management uh, may have may inform tree swallow reproductive performance and then what characteristics we can suggest to promote reproductive performance in this species. And I wanted to take another moment, although we're still talking about tree swallows, to highlight uh, why we picked that 100 meter and 200 meter radius around the boxes to think about habitat. And what we uh, we know about tree swallows is when they arrive, or what some studies have shown about tree swallows, is when they arrive to the breeding grounds and start establishing nests, they can fly great distances from, from their nest to forage for food. So they'll seek out high quality habitat, you know, wherever they need to in the region. 
However, late in the breeding season, especially when there's chicks in the nest, tree swallows tend to restrict their foraging radius greatly into about 100 to 200 meters from the nest. So this means that where we place the nest boxes may have kind of direct impacts on the ability of these birds to forage late in the breeding season and feed their young. And with this idea that there may be some relationships between conservation management and reproductive performance, we turned back to working with Mass Audubon sites and now expanded our survey to consider a wider variety of conservation management practices and landscapes. And so we used, um, we worked with seven Mass Audubon wildlife sanctuaries uh, in this conservation management piece of the project. Uh, they're all listed here. So we have Ipswich River, Drumlin Farm, Broadmoor, Stony Brook, Allen's Pond, Felix Neck and Arcadia. We had information from Ipswich River, Drumlin Farm and Broadmoor for five years. Um, and then we are just start, we've just looked at our information from our seven sites for one year, but we're currently expanding that into 2020 and now um, 2021 data collection as well. And these sites were chosen because they all have nest boxes that host tree swallows and they all use nest watch um, monitoring protocol from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. So the protocol was already standardized, making it really easy to compare nesting across sites. So again, we used our same um, habitat uh, measuring approach where we used this land cover map with information on our eight key land cover types that were present in all of our wildlife sanctuaries. And we measured their extent in each, the 100 and 200 meter foraging radii of each box. Uh, and so we have pictured here, just the 100 meter radius of a nest box at Drumlin Farm. So you can see there is developed habitat, uh, forested habitat and field habitat in the radius of this box. We have then again measured the distance between from each box to its two nearest neighbors. Um, and here more so than at Broadmoor, we had a really wide range of nest distancing or clustering approaches where there were some sites like Ipswich River that had these really uh, dense networks of nest boxes and then some sites that had much more spread out boxes. Um, and then lastly, we uh, measure this categorical variable of what type of nest managed or uh, sorry, what type of predator deterrent um, was present on each nest. And so we um, use predator deterrence on nest boxes to prevent um, climbing predators from getting into the boxes or at least these two strategies, um, that was the goal. So there was this common goal of preventing climbing predators, but at our sites, there were some boxes protected by grease. Um, so just synthetic grease slathered on the poles and some boxes protected by baffling. So even though they had the same um, goal of confusing climbing predators, uh, they are two different management strategies um, that, that achieve that goal. So we were interested in comparing first those grease and baffled boxes to see, does this simple management decision of which way to prevent climbing predators, are there any relationships with that decision and reproductive performance? Um, can we quantify any difference in success across those two predator deterrent strategies? Uh, and this is me and nest box, or in a grease, a nest box grease, pole grease, uh, that I um, applied to some boxes a couple of years ago now. And it's really gross stuff. I can attest, but you would not want to climb up it if you were a small mouse. Then we used a similar modeling approach to identify the nest management um, approaches that impact or had relationships with reproductive performance. Uh, and we did that both at our longer time series of data at three of our sites and then in 2019 across our seven sites. And from those results, we could identify management strategies that promoted or limited reproductive performance. So first we'll compare fledging success across our greased and baffled boxes. So fledging success is gonna be the y-axis on all of the figures I'm gonna show you um, in the next few slides. And what we found was that nests with greased poles had higher fledging success than those with baffled poles, which was very interesting to us as even though these are both strategies that uh, limit uh, predation much more than natural rates or background rates or rates without predator deterrence, there are significant differences in fledging as a cons or related to the predator control method you employ. And we saw that the likely driver behind these differences in fledging is that only 5% of greased uh, boxes experience predation, but about 20% of baffled boxes do. 
uh, did, sorry, in our, in our records. And while we don't know that the predator deterrent method was the sole reason that there was this difference in predation rates, um, we did include nest site in these, or the, the wildlife sanctuary site in these analyses. Um, and so even with, uh, even considering differences between sites, there was still the significant effect of a predator deterrent method. And this is really interesting because it means that we have to consider the predator deterrent type when we're doing studies of reproductive performance like I've done in nest boxes or kind of any time we're considering a human dominated landscape like a conservation area, it's really important to document all the ways that humans are making decisions in the landscape um, because you may miss a key piece of information like this if we don't include all of these management metrics. Uh, we then looked at how fledging success varied with nest habitat, and we found that uh, nests that had more forested habitat in their foraging radii were associated with lower reproductive performance, uh, which is uh, interesting. And again, we see a similar trend that we saw at just our Broadmoor site where um, where you put the box matters. Uh, and so we may be, uh, we may be better able to better manage our, our nest boxes by not placing them near forested habitat. We also found that nests that were clustered together or spaced closer than 50 meters from their neighboring nest were associated with lower reproductive performance, which may be driven by increased competition in those clusters of nest boxes. Um, to, uh, you know, to more land management um, choices that humans made that fall out as potentially impactful in reproductive performance. And then lastly, we saw that in across our seven sites in 2019, that a nest placed near to paved or developed habitat had a lower fledging success than those that were further uh, or did not have any paved or developed habitat in their foraging radii. And we see, we, we know that that may be driven by there's lower prey availability or prey quality in paved habitats, or there may be some impact of frequent human disturbance or um, human movement on the bird's fitness. So some studies have documented that when birds are nesting in habitats with a lot of people moving around, nest abandonment is higher. And so there may be this relationship between nest abandonment and human activity. And this is another avenue um, that we are continuing to kind of actively investigate. How, um, how does human use of a landscape directly, how does human use impact bird fitness? And so this was another exciting outcome. Uh, and I will just finish by um, highlighting this, oh, this should be number four. Uh, what you may be thinking, well, what is a perfect landscape in Eastern Massachusetts, at least for tree swallows look like? Um, and we found that it was uh, the best uh, best case or the, the highest success of nests uh, in terms of fledging success in particular are when nests are placed greater than 50 meters from neighboring nests. Um, we saw that greased boxes had a little higher success than uh, baffled boxes and that nests should be placed at least 200 meters from forested, paved, and developed habitat. Uh, and so a perfect landscape for tree swallows might look uh, something like this. Uh, and this work has been, um, has helped inform nest box placement at some Mass Audubon sites already. And we uh, are very excited that it does have this really direct um, application to improving uh, management of habitat for tree swallows in particular, um, and aerial insectivores more broadly. And with that, I would love to say thank you to the million people that helped me with this project. Um, I will highlight some of my undergrad uh, researchers, Dylan Hale, Thor Breitbarth, um, Alyssa Helling, Linnea Smith, uh, Melissa Russo, they were all um, really important in, in doing this work from Boston University, and I really appreciate all their help. And I'll also plug that if you ever want to get in touch with me about this work, I have um, my email linked on my website, lucyzip.com, if that is of interest. And I will finish, happy to answer questions uh, with these three pictures from field work that are like my favorite pictures that I've taken, a goose egg, uh, these very handsome tree swallows, and one time I found just one loose tree swallow egg in a nest box with no nest, um, which I thought was pretty interesting. And so thank you so much for your attention. And yeah, I'm happy to answer cues. Thank you so much, Lucy. I feel like I learned a ton and now I have tons of questions myself, but um, thank you. That was really excellent. And um, so yeah, everybody that is on the uh, webinar today, if you have a question uh, for Lucy, I'm gonna monitor questions and so I'll read them in um, so they're part of the recording. 
but if you just want to type it into um, the Q&A or if you want to type in chat, either way is fine. Um, Seth had earlier said, because I was talking about the <laughs> tufted titmouse, he said there's no official record of tufted titmouse on Nantucket, um, but one was seen on Tucker Neck, which is the small island um, to the west of Tucker Neck. I feel like there was one, but okay. Um, <laughs> All right, so in, I'm going to start asking questions if no one, <laughs> if no one else has questions. So um, for those of you who might not know, um, we have, um, I pastored Lucy and we have adopted some of um, the monitoring strategies for the nest boxes. And so Seth Engelborg, who's on our call right now, um, he's our naturalist educator and program manager. He also leads our bird walks. Um, and he has adopted the project where we're monitoring all the nest boxes at the Linda Laurie Nature Foundation. And we have just under 50. And um, I'm really interested in a few different things because um, we my, my, I monitored last year as a pilot study. And um, one of my questions was about the finding of the open water. Um, is there, was, were there commonalities in the depth of open water or was that something that was accounted for? Um, you may have said that and I missed it. Yeah, that's a great question. So the the way that we the the open water habitat is basically like ponds, <laughs> um, and then we had a second. Let me just make sure that this is true, and this is the same data I'm talking about. So we had open water, and then we had well, marsh as well as two different habitat categories. Um, I would say I presented the open water results because they're like the most the most striking, <laughs> um, but we also saw kind of any time there was fresh water there was that was associated with higher reproductive performance in the birds and specifically fledging success. Um, I do not have any info on the depth, but I do not think there was anything very deep around any of these boxes. Um, but that would be something interesting to look into. Well, yeah, and I, I guess my question related to depth was about like what type of water body. So that makes sense. Um, yeah, we had there, we separated into like pond, like still fresh water basically, and then like moving water because we have a lot oh, of that rivers. Makes sense. Yeah, so the river didn't seem to be as related or didn't have any significant relationships. Um, there wasn't as much like marsh around river, the river habitat that we have in, or at, at any of these sites. So that might be, I think the marshiness, stillness, insectiness yeah. of it all, I think <laughs> is the, the driver. All the things that people are like, ew, the insect, yeah. <laughs> I know, that's something really interesting, right? It's like, we want to see the birds and be able to like interact or, you know, at least see from a distance these nest boxes. And so there's this huge human component to all this work where, you know, the balancing the potential negative effects of frequent human disturbance with being able to see and enjoy the nature associated with these nest boxes and not want to get bit up by insects. <laughs> right. Okay, so there's a few. Um, so Ken Blackshaw says, nice job, Lucy. Thanks so much for your research and also your presentation. The decrease in diptera populations might be something worth further study as you, um, as you noted. Um, I'm interested in thinking about that too for our area, you know, kind of, I always <laughs> think of it from, a, um, from our perspective. There hasn't been any like insect spraying where we are. It's been very open habitat for a long time. So I'm interested in like the localized um, population of the insect insects that they would be eating. Um, but are the, so with the Mass Audubon properties, I know from, th there are different ages of the sanctuaries, right? So yeah. does that factor into it too potentially of, I don't know. And that's yeah. a side effect, I would guess. Yeah, definitely. That's a great question. I've I've never used like sanctuary age as a metric. We have, like I mentioned, thought about just if, the, if these differences are just site specific and we don't see that, we see that there are these trends that cross sites, but that's mm -hmm. definitely true. And, you know, just thinking about Broadmoor where I've done the most of my work, it used, a big part of it used to be like a managed orchard and now it's an open field. And so there's very different plants that live in these, in that habitat compared to others. And so we've done some surveys of like plant life and that may have some relationships with like long-term management. Um, but that's definitely true in thinking about what was there before slash what's near it that may be accidentally impacting insect populations. Um, like I mentioned, the insect work, like I'm coming from this is from a 
non-insect vet, non-insect yeah. background. And I'm, it's still like some of the most exciting stuff, but it's taking me some uh, education to ramp up to some of these cues, but soon. <laughs> I love hearing that because I think all, any of us that work in conservation, we may have, like myself included, you started out with a certain specialty, but you end up as a generalist and it's so exciting to constantly learn new things. So. It really is. And meet all these new people who have all this expertise in areas you don't. Right. It's so fun. Um, so Seth asked a question that was sort of on my mind too. He says, what types of climbing predators are of concern? We do not use any type of predator deterrent on our nest boxes at LLNF, no grease or baffle. And on Nantucket, we also lack, we lack most mammalian predators. Um, and that was my other kind of follow-up question is, were any of the nest boxes, did any of them in your study have no deterrent? None of them had no deterrents. Um, we all the sites that we were able to collect data from had some type of predator deterrent. Would be amazing to have a control, but Audubon wouldn't take the deterrents off so we could have <laughs> that control, which is totally fine because we do have a lot of climbing predators. So mice early in the season will, will mess with the eggs. Um, we'll have snakes that can get into the boxes. Um, I think those are like the two big ones that are climbing that we will, that we deal with. Uh, and then, you know, there's also flying predators that we can't that we don't control for specifically like house sparrows um, will kill tree swallows. But the nest failures that we've seen, um, so we still saw that most of the predation events I think that we documented were either from flying predators uh, or sometimes those baffles and grease if they get like mucked up or they get old and kind of crusty, you can still, the predators will still climb over them. Um, but it, I think the Lacking the mammalian predators is probably a huge <laughs> bonus for these cavity nesting species um, compared to what we have here. Yeah, and also our snakes. Um, we had a separate snake diversity study on our property and like 90 something percent of our snakes are all um, garter snakes and we have some ribbon snakes and I caught one ring neck snake one time. So we don't really have any of the kind of snakes that would climb up into the nest, I imagine. That would be interesting. That I mean, that's really cool. That's like a great place to be for you to follow. Um, well, like I said before, I mean, you know, outside of the webinar, we can, I, we're happy to share data because I think it would be really cool to, um, you know, we're using the similar um, collection methods and um, we haven't collected all of our environmental data yet because it's, you know, in, in the sense of the location measurement information. Um, we also have zero pavement. <laughs> so, wow. <laughs> um, anywhere near, our, like our road is a dirt road and our parking lot is a dirt parking lot. So it's, um, it, yeah, there's just, it's just some interesting comparisons. But um, my other question is about nest boxes. So I, because you're Mass Audubon um, or all the properties are Mass Audubon, is there a standardized nest box? Because ours are like, a lot of them were made by someone and, and they're that's of the similar ilk, right? Like the same, the right size hole for um, bluebirds and tree swallows. But um, we were noting, you know, which ones are, there's a few that are a little bit different in the material used. Yeah, we definitely, I don't know if I have, any great pictures of this, but we, there are different nest boxes at, at all these sites. We did, um, or I did <laughs> this a few years ago, because I was worried about how that may impact the study. So I took height of off the ground, height of the box and depth of the box measurements at our sites and saw to see if there was any trends in that, in those box dimensions with reproduction. I didn't find any significant trends. So I've considered it not a huge problem, okay. um, especially because, yeah, like working at in a conservation area, you can't like, I don't want to take down boxes, I'll account for it. Um, but it does not seem to be an issue as long as like the whole the whole size is really, right. is really the thing. Yeah. So I wouldn't worry about that. Yeah, we definitely have those like angle, those like triangle boxes, and then some smaller And there's ones. different, we, yeah, and there's definitely different heights. Some of them kind of like have migrated down the pole a yeah. little bit, or, you know, there's different heights from the ground. So we're monitoring, we're, we recorded all that too. So, so. Yeah, I think it's good to know, but I haven't seen that it's impactful. And we had, there's one box at Broadmoor that's made of some synthetic material, and it was getting so hot in the summer that I was like, for sure, this has got to be really bad. So I started taking measurements of the temperature inside the boxes and that wasn't important either. So it doesn't seem like any. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, so, I, mean, I think the birds like it when it's really hot in the box, if anything. So, but I was worried about nest box material as well. And I did not see any issues. Well, I would have had the same reaction. Like if it's, 
getting hot, like it would be really hot in there. And then they're like, this is great. <laughs> yeah, I think they really were thrilled to be in that <laughs> small hot box. Um, and Ken says, at LLNF, it would be interesting to do predator deterrent on some boxes to see if there's difference in nesting success resulted. Um, yeah, it would kind of be interesting. And I think, you know, I'm sure the next time we go around to collect nest box information, it'll be like in the back of our heads because, um, you know, we clean out the nest boxes before the season starts. And I know that there, uh, you know, mice have, are, have been in them sometimes, but, um, yeah, I don't know. It would be interesting from a research perspective too to see if it has any difference. Yeah, and you know, I've I reported those predation rates, but sometimes it's hard to know if it was a predation event or not. Um, but usually, if it's you know the eggs are gone <laughs> or smashed, yeah. we'll, we'll call it the predation event. Um, but yeah, it would be interesting just just to see. Uh, yeah, it's it's a little bit hard to to monitor, but if you're all working together on the monitoring, you know, you would have a best shot possible in, in documenting a predation a bit. All right, well, are there any other, okay, the nest box with just the single egg and no nest was fascinating. It That's really <laughs> shocking when I opened the box. My <laughs> my best guess in talking to people was, was a, a maybe a first year female or kind of an immature female who was ready to lay an egg, but hadn't gotten the nest together yet. So just dumped it in an empty box. Um, because I need to get rid of this. Yeah. <laughs> later a bird built, I don't know. I mean, I have no idea if it was the same female, but a bird uh, built a nest on top of the egg and then laid a clutch in that box. But you know, the egg was uh, not viable <laughs> after a little bit. But yeah, I, I remember looking at it and thinking like, did someone take the nest out? Like why <laughs> would they have done that? But it seems that it's not not as crazy as maybe I thought it actually was. It's so interesting. Cool. Um, and I had one one quick question too is um, overall, um, is there a general percentage of occupation of um, nest boxes? Yeah, we um, usually get, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. That was the. Yeah. We usually get, I think it's like, I've done this math. It's like 86% of our boxes are usually occupied at these sites. And it's, like 70% of those are tree swallows. So we do get bluebirds, but the majority of these box of, of the boxes at these sites are being used by tree swallows. Um, this there's been since I so it's kind of funny, another like research versus conservation issue is I was not changing the boxes during my my you know five years of PhD work, and some of them were kind of in, in various states of disrepair because I didn't want to change the conditions of the site. But this year. We just, um, me and working with the great people at Broadmoor specifically, have changed, have redone a lot of the boxes. So we're going to see if there is increased occupation with these nicer boxes now than there were um, the last five years. <laughs> um, so that may be that may have something to do with the fact that some of them just never were never used. <laughs> That's great. I think some of ours um, we have we had two pro we had. We have one property that we've had for a while and then we acquired a new property that's adjacent. They both had nest boxes on them for some time. And so some of them are quite older and we did some repairs, but we didn't want to add any brand new boxes for the same reason. We kind of moved some around and um, and added poles and things like that. But it's really it'll be really interesting to see. So I'm excited and um, yeah, this is exciting. It's kind of neat to see where, how far you've been able to take it. And I'm really excited about the insect work too. Thank you. Um, yeah, we're, we're doing, yeah, working on that, getting started now. So hopefully we'll have some fun new results to share next year. <laughs> awesome. Um, are there any other questions before I let Lucy go? I think that's all we have for right now. Well, Lucy, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm, this has been, I've learned so much and um, I'm excited because I can see immediate applications for us too, which is always exciting. That's great. I really appreciate you hanging out with me this evening. Always fun to talk about birds right at the beginning of breeding season. What's better than that? <laughs> I know, right? It's exciting. So um, I am, I'm stopping. Okay. Thanks again.